If you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Mark chapter 1. And if you came in this morning, you should have gotten your uh, outline in your order of worship, and we will uh, go through that in just a moment. Uh, You'll see there we'll be in Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, and we'll be talking about the beginning of the gospel. Before we get there, I know that this, uh, this past week has uh, unshaped in our country some uh, unique and difficult and really um, devastating type events. Your heart has probably been grieved at what we experienced and watched, and um, I just want to encourage us this morning with what we've talked about and what we've encouraged one another with in Philippians 3, verse 20. Our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to remind you this morning that in the midst of shifting sands and a culture that is changing and all sorts of different things happening since the beginning to this time today, that our hope is in a coming Savior, that our citizenship is in heaven and from it we await a Savior. We long for a Savior. I don't know if any of you on Wednesday were just longing, Jesus, would you just come back? Would you just make things right? We see, as we've talked about over and over again, Philippians 3.20, from our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we will await, we will long for, we will hope and anticipate that Savior who will come back. And until that time comes, friends, our goal and our calling is from 1 Timothy 2 to pray for kings and those in positions of authority. Our calling is to pray earnestly for our country and for our leaders, for our nation, And so this morning, I want us to pray. Pray for President Donald Trump, to pray for President-elect Joe Biden and for this transition, to pray for our country, and pray for each of us, that we would shine our gospel light brighter and brighter and brighter in the midst of a dark culture, that we would speak truth when truth is needed, that we would pray for our leaders to have godly wisdom, to pray that they would have the fear of the Lord over them, to pray for wise and godly advisors to surround them, to pray that they would run from evil and to cling from good and that they would be healthy and their families would be healthy. Friends, it's easier to point our fingers and assign blame and do all sorts of different things, but our calling is to get on our knees in prayer for our leaders, both in the national, the state, and our city officials. And so right now, would you join my heart and let's pray together for our country and for our leaders. Dear Lord, we pray right now. We watched evil unfold on Wednesday, and Lord, we we want to repent where we as a people have fallen short. Or we want to pray for our leaders at the national level, at the state level, and at the local level. Or we pray for our current president, Donald Trump. We pray for our incoming president, president-elect, Joe Biden. Lord, would you fill them with your will and with the knowledge of your will and with the fear of you. That they would govern and lead with convictions that come from you. Lord, we pray that they would have wisdom that comes from you that they would stand up for the unborn, that they would stand up for the injustices happening all around us, Lord, that they would seek righteousness and good and that they would turn from evil. Lord, we pray for our president, we pray for our governor, we pray for our mayor, we pray for every local and state and national elected and unelected official, Lord, would you allow their hearts to be broken by you. And Lord, I pray for us as a church that we would rise up to shine our gospel light brighter than we ever have before. People who trust in you and hope in you and follow you through everything that we walk through. Lord, would we trust daily in you? Would we repent where we've fallen short? Or repent where we have put our hope in shaky and unsolid ground? Where we... We thank you for this country that we can, we can gather together as a faith family and talk openly about our faith, that we can pray for one another, that we can point each other towards Jesus. So Lord, I pray that that would continue, that we would live in this free country to enjoy the freedoms that we are given. Lord, I pray that we would never take those for granted. Lord, I pray individually, 
individually, as a body of believers, individually, that we would shine our gospel light brighter than ever. And that as we live in this world, as we walk out of this sanctuary, people could see there is something different about this people who trust in the name of Jesus. So Lord, we love you. Lead and guide us this morning. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you turn your attention now to Mark chapter 1? We will be uh, in verses 1 through 8, and you'll see the title of your outline this morning is The Beginning of the Gospel. So so let me read Mark chapter 1, 1 through 8, and then we'll talk about and allow the Lord to lead us in our discussion. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a belt around his waist and ate locust and wild honey. And while he preached, saying, After me, he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, as we get into the book of Mark, there's a few things and and background information that I want to give to you, and that the book of Mark is an an anonymous book. At no point in the book of Mark do you see anybody take uh, credit for what's written. Early church fathers pointed to John Mark, kind of an obscure uh, apostle or disciple of Peter, as the writer of the book of Mark. And so here you have John Mark, the writer of the book of Mark, who followed Peter around, a disciple of Peter. And so much of Mark's writing is coming from Peter's preaching and teaching and watching what Peter did. In the book of Mark, you don't have a chronological viewpoint of the gospel, and you don't have a chronological viewpoint of everything that Jesus did in time and space. But what you have is a detailed covering of what Jesus did and said and how he lived and talked and walked and performed miracles. We have a a firsthand witness from Peter of uh, what Jesus did. This book was written in Rome sometime around Peter's martyrdom in AD 60, and in it we have the title verse of Mark 1.1. So often you get uh, titles or introductory type passages, and in the book of Mark, you see Mark 1.1 is John Mark's clear introduction to what he's going to do. It says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. You see your key point number one on your outline is the key point is gospel means good news. Now, you likely knew that, and I'm not telling you something you don't know, but it's important that we understand that here in Mark 1.1, this is going to be exactly where Mark is going to go throughout his book. Now, gospel means good news, and we understand that it's a dual-fold sense in which Mark is writing. It's the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that Mark is going to write about Jesus, that the pages of Mark's gospel are going to be filled with Jesus Everything is going to point back to what Jesus did, how we reacted, how we responded, and the good news about Jesus. But it's also the gospel of Jesus Christ and that Jesus himself is the gospel. Now, this word gospel in the Greek is such an interesting word, and it likens back to the olden days when there would be a victory in battle. When the Greeks would have a victory, they would run back and share the good news, right? They would share the gospel that there has been a victory on battle, and they have come out victorious. So you can see them coming back to the people and sharing good news. We've won the victory. The battle has been won. The enemy has been defeated. You can see how we've gotten this word here in our day. Mark is the first of the gospel writers to use the word gospel, and even 2,000 some odd years later, we're using the word gospel because we understand that Jesus has overcome death, defeated the grave. He has won your victory and my victory. So it's a battle cry of good news that you and I have victory. The death has been defeated. The victory has been won. When you woke up this morning, the mercies of the Lord were new for you today. And so in the beginning, much like John started in in Genesis, it started in the beginning was the word. Here we have the beginning of the gospel. 
It's not good views. It is good news. This is the joy of the believer that we get to share good news. Friends, do you recognize that as a believer, you're not walking around and called to share bad news? You're not called to leave the sanctuary and walk into a world and say, man, I got some rough news to share with you guys. This is rough. You're not going to like to hear this. No, friends, you get to share good news that there is a Savior who loves and cares for you and has died in your place to save you of all of your sins and that you can spend an eternity with him. We get to share good news. I'm thankful, friends, that my calling as a pastor is not to share bad news with people. As an evangelist, you as an evangelist of the gospel get to share good news of Jesus that he has overcome, that he has defeated death, defeated the grave, and he has won the victory. And so this morning, recognize here that everything that we're going to talk about, every place that we go, everything that Mark talks about comes back to the centrality of the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And so we see the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then Mark continues, as it is written, Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And we're going to see who that is in verse 4. It is John the Baptist, John the baptizer. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Verse 6 tells us a description of what John was like. He was clothed in camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And when he preached, he said, After me comes one who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not even worthy to stoop down and untie. On your outline, you see your first key takeaway is that John knew that he was not Jesus. John knew that he wasn't Jesus. Long ago in Isaiah, Isaiah prophesied about this prophet who would come to prepare the way of Jesus, that this guy was going to come and prepare the pathway of Jesus to prepare the way for this coming Savior. But John knew that it wasn't him. See, and you look back to... um, John chapter 1, verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came to witness and bear witness about the light, but he was not the light. John has a razor clear focus on who he is and what he is called to, that he is not Jesus, but he was called to prepare the way for Jesus. John the baptizer is essentially a servant ready to do whatever God was calling him to do. Recognize the humility that is in John. I mean, think about how we talked about Paul in Philippians 1. The very first sentence in Paul's letter to the Philippians is, Paul, an apostle and servant of Christ Jesus. John knew that he was not Jesus. Paul knew that he wasn't Jesus. And his razor-clear focus was to do the will of God in his life, to point people to Jesus. It's incredibly important, friends, that we understand, and I don't believe any of us would stand up here and say, hey, I'm struggling. I think I may be Jesus. I don't think anybody's in the pew today saying, I may be Jesus, but at times we live our lives in such a way that we elevate our will and our plans above what God is calling us to do in our lives, how we preach and love and share and tell people, and so we elevate our mission and our calling above what God has called us ultimately to do. I don't think any of you in this room are called to go out into the wilderness and begin preaching a message of repentance and don your camel hair and your leather belt and begin calling people to repent of their sins and be baptized today. I don't think any of you, uh, maybe you are, I don't know, are called to go out and don the camel hair and the the leather belt and begin eating locusts and wild honey. But all of us, all of us are called to prepare the way of Jesus in people's lives. And what did John do? He called people to repent of their sins. This was his singular message. Not flashy, not showy, not with crazy lights and all sorts of stuff. John simply preached a message of repentance, calling people to turn from their sins and follow this coming Messiah. It's the same message that we preach even to this day. 
that my calling as pastor of First Baptist Church is to call people to repentance and to prepare the way for Jesus to work in people's lives. And can I tell you that so often it's easy to point our finger and say, man, if they would just repent. Man, look at the Pharisees coming out and seeing John. And we see Matthew 3, it's recorded that the Pharisees came out to John and to hear his message. And John sent them away and called them brood of vipers because they would not repent of their sins and come to Jesus. And friends, let me tell you, it's easy. It is so easy for us to get into this mindset that if they would just repent, if the other people would repent, if all these other people in my culture, in my world, if all of them would just repent, if my wife would repent, if my mother-in-law would repent, if my boss would repent, if those other Christians across the street would repent, then our world would be a lot better. But we are called to repent. And so my calling for you this morning is, have you repented of your sins? Have you gotten on your knees and repented and confessed your sin where you have fallen short? Friends, we all have blind spots and places in our life that we must repent of our sins. And so you see people coming out to John the Baptist, hearing this message of repentance. And what are they doing? They're confessing their sins to one another. What a glorious practice for the church to take hold of is to confess your sins to one another. I've talked about this week in and week out that we must confess. It's good for us to confess our sins to one another, to talk about where we've fallen short. That's how we find hope and healing and forgiveness for our trespasses is when we bring them to the light. I believe so often we sit in darkness unwilling to repent of our sins because we are unwilling to bring them up and confess them to one another. And so here you have John in complete humility with a razor focus calling people to repent of their sins. And friends, we get to a dangerous spot in our lives and our Christian existence when we refuse to repent. As you read God's word, as you hear God's word communicated and taught in your Bible fellowship classes, as you talk about it and walk in it and live in it and let you saturate in your heart, when you come to times in your life, you allow the Lord to prune your soul of the warts of sin. When you want to follow Jesus and trust in Jesus and walk with him, it requires that we turn our lives from sin and repent of it. And so here you see, All the country of Judea and Jerusalem were going out to him, and they were being baptized in him because they were confessing their sin. That John was proclaiming a baptism of repentance. This is how he was preparing the way for the Lord. So, Friends, let me ask you. John knew that he wasn't Jesus, that his calling in humility was razor sharp to call people towards repentance. So this morning, let me... Let me encourage you to seek your own soul. When your heartbeat wants to say, if they would just repent, if they would just turn their lives around. But my question for us this morning is, do you need to repent? Are you missing the power and presence of the Lord in your life because you have an all-out pride-based refusal to repent of your sins? As the Lord begins to work in your life, I believe that he begins to reveal things and short spots in your life that you need to rid yourself of because John's ultimate goal is your second key takeaway is to simply point people to Jesus. John knew he wasn't Jesus. And number two, John pointed people to Jesus. In verse 7, you see, and he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That John is pointing people to Jesus. Back at John chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, there was a man who was sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Friends, your primary purpose and goal as a believer is to point people to Jesus. Let me say that more clearly. Your primary purpose on this earth is to point people to Jesus. In your marriages, point people to Jesus. In your singleness, point people to Jesus. In your jobs, point people to Jesus. 
In your homes, point people to Jesus. In your sickness, point people to Jesus. In your health, point people to Jesus. In your rejoicing, point people to Jesus. In your going, in your coming, point people to Jesus. In your frustrations, point people to Jesus. In your anxieties, point people to Jesus. When you fail and fall short, point people to Jesus. In your confession, point people to Jesus. In everything, in every way, in every moment of every day, your calling is to point people to Jesus. Not yourself, not what you can do. Your goal, friends, is to point people towards Jesus. So let me ask. We're 10 days into 2021. How are you pointing people to Jesus? The words that you say, the words that you type, the things that you do, the ways that you walk, the ways that you reflect, are you pointing people towards a risen Savior? See, this is John's goal over and over. This is all of the preachers and teachers in the Bible, the apostles. Their goal was not to point people to them, to have people follow them. Their goal was simply to point people to a Savior who could save and redeem. This goes back to to Mark chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the gospel, that we have a gospel that is called to be shared and shown and told, not kept internal. Friends, John with his life, even though he was foretold about years and years and years by the prophet Isaiah, even though he simply could have said, I am a prophet, you listen to me, his goal was singular to point people towards Jesus. Friends, we live in a world that is divided, that is walking through difficulty. We have friends who are sick and hurting, We have relationships that are being fractured and torn apart. And our goal is to be people of peace who run with the gospel to hurting situations that don't shy away from messiness and hurt and heartache, but we bring the gospel that can heal and redeem and restore with us. We bring to situations the good news of the gospel. We take it with us. And so often I fear as Christians we are pointing people to everything but Jesus. We're pointing people to our favorite restaurants. We're pointing people to our favorite computers and our favorite places to hobby and our favorite vacation spots. We're pointing people to our preferred view of government. Friends, are we pointing people to the only hope that we have? The question is we walk out of this place as we leave the doors of the sanctuary and we walk into our cars and we go about our jobs and our daily lives, my question for you this morning is how? How are you pointing people towards Jesus? I pray as we walk and talk and share and show that our lives reflect the good news message of the gospel that saves, restores, and redeems. And I believe in a a church like this that has saved and redeemed you and it is possible that it can save and redeem a lost world. Would you pray with me now? Dear Father, we ask that you help us. Friends, we are, Lord, we are not perfect. We have fallen short. We have, we've made mistakes. We're, we need your presence in our lives and Lord, I pray that you help us. Lord, would my life reflect your goodness in my life reflect your gospel, in my going, in my coming, in the way that I parent, the way that I love, the way that I share, the way that I go, the way that I tell, the way that I I live my life and my actions and my reactions, Lord, would I reflect your gospel? Would I point people to you today, Lord? Help me. Lord, I pray that my gospel light would shine brighter today than ever before. Lord, we thank you for your good news that you have won the victory over death, over sin, and over the grave. Lord, thank you that if we have trusted in you, there is therefore now no condemnation. So Lord, we love you. We thank you for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.